everyone, and welcome to another episode of the Amplify Horse Racing Podcast. I am Anise Mont Pleasure, always joined by the lovely Caitlin Christofferson, who survived Breeders' Cup. <laughs> yes. <laughs> How was it? Oh my goodness. It was it was a roller coaster. Every year I think I figure it out a little bit more, but every year presents new issues, new challenges, some some good, some bad. Um, this was definitely an emotional year. You know, there was a lot going on in the industry and we had some um, some really tragic storylines and um, some that were just, you know, downright unfortunate and some that were really inspiring and uplifting. And, and as a team, we, uh, we just kind of held on to each other throughout you know, the, the two week lead up and, and the post. Um, but yeah, there was a lot going on and, and it just kind of reminds you all again, you know, that we are all in this together, that horse racing cannot exist, um, without all of the people in it that, that make everything happen. So at the end of the day, it was, it was really good. Happy, happy to be home, happy to, um, have another Breeders' Cup in the books. I was certainly thinking of you guys. I was watching from home this year, which actually was a welcome break because I totally understand the emotional roller coaster and the hard work that goes into Breeders' Cup. And uh, I'm glad that you were able to to lean on your team. And uh, it's kind of nice to have the year winding down a little bit. It's not I would say now it's winding down for Amplify. This last weekend might have been one of our busiest weekends of the year. So it's kind of nice. The hills now all coming back to Kentucky. So there's so many people who just go directly from Breeders' Cup back to the sales. And that's a whole mm -hmm. thing. <laughs> we brought some a couple award-winning Amplify mentees to Kentucky for a behind-the-scenes tour experience, which was really cool to see the industry through their eyes, you know, through fresh eyes and a lot of enthusiasm. Social media. That was so Yeah. Cool. We had a young professionals networking event. So again, just going back to having that team or that network of people around you, you know, none of us could do what we do if it weren't for amazing volunteers and team members and supporters. So. And I feel like that kind of ties in nicely with our episode because we have <laughs> Nate Newby, who is the SVP and GM, well, you actually have his full bio, which is so impressive, Anise. But um, yeah, I think he started out as like an intern at Santa Anita. And yeah. we don't usually read full bios on the podcast, but Nate's is so cool because it covers such a variety of, you know, things. He's not just a general manager. He has immersed himself in so many different aspects of the industry. So I do want to go ahead and read that. Nate Newby started his career as an intern in marketing and publicity at Santa Anita in 2002. He was promoted to director of marketing in 2011 and then vice president of marketing in 2013, where he oversaw marketing, promotions, and sponsor sponsorship sales at Santa Anita. He's been a key executive in organizing nine Breeders' Cup World Championships, and it is indeed nine this year at Santa Anita Park, and is a three-time National Horse Players Championship qualifier. Nate's expertise extends to handicapping tournaments, directing over 100, including the Pegasus World Cup Betting Championship. Nate enjoys all aspects of the horse industry, including owning and breeding California breads. While attending Col Colorado State University, he was an assistant trainer in Colorado and New Mexico, and he supports and volunteers at multiple animal-related charities, including Pasadena Humane Society, Karma, and TAA. Nate resides in Pasadena with his wife, Sterling, and owns several off-the-track thoroughbreds. So he's such a cool example of this, you know, executive in the industry who finds time to volunteer. He was an intern who made it to you know, his, an intern for Santa Anita, I should say, and worked his way up to his existing role and yeah. uh, is just a cool That's dude to cool. talk to. And, I, and again, I, I touched on it in the podcast, you know, we, we've worked with Nate for several years through Breeders' Cup and GSS and just different projects. And I had no idea what a dynamic guy he was. So this was, this was such a joy and especially getting to recap Breeders' Cup now that we can all kind of 
you know, breathe a little bit of a sigh. Yeah. Like we've got this year past us. We've got the 40th running in the books and, um, you know, we've got our champions. And, and so, yeah, it was really great to be able to spend some time with Nate. Awesome. Let's jump into the episode. We are super excited to be joined today by Nate Newby, Senior Vice President and General Manager for Santa Anita. Nate just went through a whole haul of putting on yet another Breeders' Cup. Nate, I think your bio said that you, uh, when you sent it to us, said that you put on nine Breeders' Cups at Santa Anita. So was that just now the 10th that you guys wrapped up with? No, I included this year. So I was-, I was uh, Gotcha, gotcha. You were already ready for it. <laughs> Well, welcome. Thank you so much for joining us today on the Amplify Horse Racing podcast. Absolutely. Thanks for having me on. And as we heard in your bio, I mean, you have such a you know diverse range of experiences in the industry from you know having trained and been involved in aftercare and you know coming up as an intern at Santa Anita, but. So I want to start at the very beginning with how you originally got involved or interested in the thoroughbred industry and lead us up to how you ended up in your career that you're currently in. Sure. Yeah, absolutely. So I, I started, I grew up in Colorado and uh, my dad always had a couple of horses. My family always had a couple, you know, very obviously horse racing uh, in Colorado, uh, very different than Santa Anita. Um, and then uh, he moved to New Mexico and I spent, finished my last two years of high school in New Mexico. And we just had, you know, some cheap horses. He, uh, he works at a brokerage, but also had his trainer's license. And so it was just kind of a family uh, operation before work, before school, after work and school, we would train, you know, five or six horses. And so I uh, started out just hot walking and then kind of worked my way up, got my assistant trainer's license. Um, I went to Colorado State and the last two summers there actually would have a, a small barn, five or six horses at Arapahoe Park um, that I ran with, with my then girlfriend, now wife, um, who, was, who I converted from the show world to uh, racing. And uh, it was just a two person operation. We just trained and she was the exercise rider, groom. We were groom, hot walker. Uh, you know, at the small tracks, you do you do all the jobs, and uh, that's that's how I got started. And then after school in 2002, I got a six week internship for Santa Anita's Autumn Meet, which was then Oak Tree Racing Association, a nonprofit. So they would bring in interns, and, and it was great. You did a week in every department or in six different departments wow. at Santa Anita. So it was the perfect intro. Um, I spent a week in the marketing department, a week in the publicity department, operations. Um, you know, and got really got to see the Santa Anita all over, got to meet all the different uh, department heads and then got really lucky at the end of my uh, six weeks there, the Seabiscuit was starting to film at Santa Anita with Universal Studios. So they needed somebody um, young and ready to just be on the set like morning till night and be the liaison between the studio group and Santa Anita staff. So I got wow. uh, got to do that for my first couple of months. And again a, a really good experience where you you know learn all the different areas of santa anita you learn how to deal with all the different uh you know departments and, and staff um on both sides with universal and i didn't have any background in the uh in uh film business either so it was a learning experience but a, a very fun way to intro and then uh I got lucky again, timing is everything, where somebody quit in the marketing department right as the last uh, week of filming, and I was able to get a job, you know, get offered a job there and, and kind of just started at Santa Anita and worked my way up from there. So it was a, it was a good intro where uh, a bit lucky on timing where people left at the right time, and, um, you know, it's, it was a great experience and a good way to, I, I highly recommend that to any young people where if you get a, an option to try a little bit of everything where it, you know where you work in different departments meet different people it, it helped me not only get to meet everybody which was really important for getting offered the job you know six weeks later but also um you, you learn what you like and i i knew right away like marketing and, and 
teaching, bringing in new people. I, you know, just growing up in Colorado, New Mexico, I would bring my friends to the track and they would know nothing about racing. And I was always the racing guy. And um, so I knew I enjoyed it. But then when you got to Santa Anita in the marketing department and you were doing it on a much bigger scale, I loved it. So it was, uh, I knew that that was where I wanted to be. That's so interesting. And it's such a good point too, Nate. I, we've known each other for a few years now and, you know, we've done some work together, uh, GSS and Santa Anita, but I had no idea that you had the background as the horseman. And it's, it's so interesting because I feel like when we do bring people on the podcast, so many people have, you know, you would think like, oh, he's just a marketing guy, but you're not, you're, you're so much more. You've, you've done it all. And like, I think that's such an interesting perspective uh, and it's something that's really unique to our industry that you can work in such different like facets of the industry and have so much experience. So it's, you know, you know what they have to go through on the backside to make all the pieces work and like, you know what it takes in the front of the house now too. Yeah, very, very helpful, especially in my current role as GM to know you know, all the different or have a, a good idea and be able to put yourself in the position of, of whoever you're working with, whether it's the horsemen, the breeders, you know, the other uh, the department heads at Santa Anita and all the stakeholders that we work with. It's, it's really helpful to have some experience in a bunch of different areas for sure. Yeah. What was the most interesting thing that you learned from working on the Seabiscuit set? Oh, God. It, was it, there it was anything funny. that really surprised you about, you know, working with a movie? Yes, uh, I, I can remember some days where you're there for, you know, 14, 15 hours and long, long days and you're going well into the evening and they're shooting over and over and over again the same scene and like it's how many hours it takes and then you watch the movie and it's literally like six seconds of the movie. You're like, that was an entire day spent on that six seconds. <laughs> so that it was kind of wild. I didn't uh, I didn't understand that and it was it blew my mind a little bit, but it was fun. It was a good experience. That was one of the movies when I, I mean, I saw it and I had to see it because of course it was horses, but I wasn't in horse racing at the time. I was just living in Texas, loving horses. And when I saw it, I thought, oh, wow, you know, there's a whole industry out there. Like, I bet there's, uh, I bet there's jobs and careers in this industry. And that was kind of one of, I mean, that was the film that spurred it. So it's, it's so funny how things come full circle. I mean, how many days, Nate, were, and I totally, I've never been on a movie set, but I can kind of imagine what you are talking about where, you know, especially there, it's like they were probably getting the shot of you know, them coming down the stretch or something, you know, over and over again. And then they use one out of like probably a thousand takes. Uh, how many days were they actually on site at Santa Anita? I want to say it was probably around two to three months. I, I oh, wow. went back uh, a, a while, but I think it was somewhere in there. And and yeah, the horse racing stuff was was uh, fascinating. The you know stuff on the track, and and they had you know just the best people involved with that, with Chris McCarran and Gary Stevens and all that. So that was really interesting. But then even just the scenes, like in the you know in the saddling barn or the jocks room with people, like it just how much goes in. The, the massive scope of the operation that the, that they have just to film a, a fairly what it looks when you're watching the movie it looks like a fairly simple scene but knowing what what it took uh, to make that happen it's pretty amazing well, that's so cool for for somebody who is, you know gravitates towards marketing to be involved in you know such a high level operation like filming such a big Whatever. I don't know what it what um, what Seabiscuit ended up being at the box office, like how much money it generated. But I know it was a really big film for the time. And so that's so cool for what you went on to do. And to the point of being an intern and the fact that you, you know, were an intern at Santa Anita and now you're running Santa Anita. That's not something that we see a lot nowadays with with mine and caitlin's generation and and gen zers you see people job hopping a lot do you have any advice to that on you know somebody who's starting as an intern at a company and maybe has a passion to move up and continue progressing in the same company um you know whether it's making a positive impression or how to continue to elevate yourself 
Yeah, no, it's it's a good point, and I, and obviously I'm a bit biased because just of my experience and how it went. But you know, I, I when Santa Anita is your office and you get to come to work here every day, you're very lucky. And so I was just very motivated to like every job they offered me, every task they offered me. I said yes. Like Seabiscuit, when they obviously that one sounded cool, but like you, it was really long days for not much money, and that that was probably why they were looking for somebody just beyond the intern to help kind of take that task on. And then, you know, when you started in the marketing department, like, you know, you're you're not making much money. There's certainly other careers and, and industries you, you would do quite a bit better, but I just really loved it. And so I said, OK, I'm going to just say yes to everything, work hard, show up every day, uh, have a good attitude. You know, that's it sounds so simple and, and kind of uh, basic, but like it's it's true. Like if you show up and, and work hard like it, it, it does help. And I think people kind of, that's an underrated thing, uh, especially nowadays where people are looking like, you know, if you're not happy right away or you don't, you don't move up as quickly as you think you should, like sometimes it just takes a little time. I mean, it took me, I've been at Santa Anita now just over 21 years. So, wow. um, you know, you got to put in some work and, and, and I'm sure there were many times along the way where I was like, I, I feel like I'm, you know, should you know, am I doing the right thing or should I be in a different industry or I feel like I should be moving up faster? And, um, you know, sometimes you have to be a bit patient. I know that's easier said than done. <laughs> I guess another another point to that would be, you know, how did you keep it interesting to yourself along the way? Because I think that's maybe where a lot of people get into the job hopping thing nowadays is the, you know, they get bored with something and then it's so easy to jump on to the next thing. How did you continue to find things to, you know, to be intellectually stimulating, um, you know, to keep loving the job? No, good point. And I think that's part of why you're really lucky at Santa Anita, because we do so many different things, especially in marketing department. You know, obviously, I love the racing side, um, I'm very into the handicapping side. We, we started to we probably do more uh live money handicapping contests than any track in the country. I was really focused on that early on. The first BCBC was at Santa Anita, which I you know, helped with. And so right away I knew like, this is something I'm interested in. So it's all the different things that, that kind of came along of, you know, I, I didn't do the same thing for 21 years for sure. And, and even outside of racing, like we do events, concerts, um, you know, it's a 320 acre or 10 acre facility now um, so that has so many things going on year round. So you, it, it, you, if you stay engaged and you're uh, willing to jump in on a bunch of different products, projects, you won't get bored. So that mm -hmm. in that sense, I was a bit lucky. Like if you're just in a regular office job where, you know, you were doing the same thing over and over, I could absolutely, see where that's very different than, than my experience. And so speaking of like large scale productions, one being the multi-million dollar movie Seabiscuit, and now you said it was your ninth Breeders' Cup. Um, Breeders' Cup, it's still never, I think that was my seventh working it, my ninth there. Um, You're catching up. Nice. <laughs> yeah, I know. I'm not sure how that happened. I had to like write down all the years. And I was like, that's seven in a row that I've been working well. Um, but it, it still never ceases to amaze me what a production it is. And I'm sure, you know, the same can be said. I mean, how do, what is it like for Santa Anita when Breeders Cup <laughs> comes to town? <laughs> I, it, it's amazing and wild and crazy and probably, you know, uh, at times a bit frustrating for probably our staff and the Breeders' Cup staff just because it, it's su such a, a massive operation and you're, you know, we start almost a year out. We're prepping the facility. This year we did work in the quarantine barns because we knew we had a, a huge international contingent uh, coming. So we we had we started work out there like nine months before the event. Our, our facility is an 89 year old building and and we have, you know, we have some big days at Santa Anita, like our opening day this year um, on 1226 was 43,000 people. So we have some big days, but most days you, you, you don't have every inch of a one million square foot facility operating. And so 
you have to go in and prep areas that haven't seen action in some cases since the last time we hosted a Breeders' Cup in 2019. So the the team that our facilities and operations team, our food and beverage team, they they put in a lot of work, uh, you know, for months and months leading up to the event to get us ready and. And so it's, uh, and you know, and then of course the Breeders' Cup team is, is out helping planning along the way. We do a, a ton of meetings leading up to, and then the weeks before, most most everybody's on site, so we're all just working together. And and you're just uh, at that point, you're you're solving problems that that pop up. You're doing the last minute planning and and things like that. But uh, it's it's crazy, but I love it too. It's the energy that comes with it, and then and then when when you're looking out at a full Santa Anita grandstand and people are cheering, you know. And my my most amazing moment in my career, at least, was of course when Zenyatta won the classic. I was down, you know, fair just above Clocker's Corner because we were hosting BCBC down there, and I was helping out with that or checking in on that uh, during the running of the classic. So when she went by me at like the eighth pole you know, just at the start of the stretch, um, that was when the crowd just erupted. And um, it was still one of the most amazing things I've ever seen. People are crying and hugging each other. And like, wow. um, I think even being down at that end of the grandstand versus the finish line, which is always thought of as like the best seats, like that was a, an even more amazing view because that's when she made her her big move and was weaving in between horses. So it's, uh, you know, it's moments like that that like make all the craziness so much, so worth it really. Yeah. So when does the planning process start and what does Santa Anita have to do versus Breeders' Cup and then what you guys collaborate on, you know, between all the tasks that you guys I'm sure have to divide up from the time that you start the process to actually getting to Breeders' Cup? What does that all look like? Well, it's very much a team effort. Um, you know, the Breeders' Cup has such a good team. Obviously, I've worked with them now for nine events. So they're, you know, an amazing team, but now like good friends too. Um, you spend a lot of time together, so <laughs> you, get, you get close. Um, but so like, you know, we will we'll bid on the event typically a two plus years out in most wow. cases that that'll kind of, so that's when you put in the initial bid and the, you start the budget process and all those things. Um, and then uh, it really, the planning really ramps up, you know, close to a year leading up to it where you're starting to, you know, make decisions on, you know, some, especially like some capital projects that we needed to do at Santa Anita to have the facility ready. Um, the owner area, for example, the owner viewing area in the mornings, we, we needed to move. So we fixed up an area, the grandstand at Santa Anita that hadn't had, you know, just inside of Clocker's Corner that it had not been touched in, 50 years basically it, it did not look like it does now and so we, we started that and and so you're you're working together on all those kind of long-range plans and um you know the racing teams work together very closely because obviously the breeders cup team is is taking the lead on recruiting horses but um you know our, our racing team at santa anita will will still be in talking to horses you know around the country and internationally because people want to kind of talk to the host side as well and have mm -hmm. specific questions so that's that's a team effort. Um, you know, the Breeders' Cup really takes the lead on the ticketing side, which is a huge operation. And, you know, Brandy and her team run that and they've, they've been doing a They do an amazing job. So there's there's things that, that they take the lead on. But then as you get closer, like our ticket office opens up and they're they're, you know, working hand in hand and we're selling tickets on site. So it's uh, there's very few areas that we don't have to work together on, I guess, is the the quick or the the quick version of that long answer what's what's your favorite part of the process and least favorite part of the process good questions oh that's a good one um well it, I, I don't know about the the process my favorite part of the event is like the week or two leading up to just walking around the facility and, and the facility starts to look amazing better than it ever has because we've just spent so much time and effort and money getting it ready and then and then you see the horses, you know, the horses a week or two start to show up um, where you're just walking. Like, I love going to the paddock in the mornings and, and you're looking at schooling and you're just like, this is like the best horses in the world. And your head's on a swivel and 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 then you go to Clocker's Corner and you're talking to, you know, the, the most interesting people, you know, that have come in from all over the world. So I, I love that aspect of it. Um, what was the second part of your question? It was my least favorite. Least favorite part. <laughs> 
uh, it, you, it's nerve wracking. Like it with, with all those eyeballs and all the world's attention, which I love, like it's stressful. Like you're, you, you do not want anything to go wrong and certainly anything that we could control. So, you know, any mistakes that we made, any, anything we forgot about. So you're, you know, my mind is always racing and, and that, that really helps with the doing it multiple times. And you can kind of think back, like, you start checking the boxes in your head, like, okay, make sure this is covered, that's covered. Like if, if we'd made a mistake in one of the past events, you definitely remember that you can kind of go check on it, make sure a setup or whatever is working, but it's a, it's a stressful event. I know for the Breeders' Cup team and our team, like, you know, there's not a lot of sleep the couple of weeks leading up to it and everybody's kind of at the end of, you know, I'm sure there's times where uh, we're frustrated with them and they're frustrated with us, but at the end we all hug and love each other. <laughs> And Caitlin, oh, go ahead. <laughs> oh, no, I was just going to say I, to echo, you know, what Nate said, um, it's it's definitely a team effort, but Santa Anita is so amazing. I mean, I absolutely love when we go there and it's beautiful and I love being there like the week and the week before too and starting to see all the purple go up and everything. Um, and I think one of the things that's so unique about Santa Anita, you mentioned, you know, that it's like a 90 year old facility is <clears throat> that, that and it's really interesting to me again tying in sea biscuit seeing see seeing santa anita like i can spot you know i still watch the movie but now when i watch the movie i'm like i know exactly where that took place and it still looks um santa anita, you guys have done an amazing job of keeping up the track and maintaining the history while you know, making sure that it's safe and like enjoyable for everybody. And it's just, and it, it always takes my breath away how massive it is always. Nice. Yeah. Thank you. That's definitely been our goal is, you know, over the last 15 years, we put quite a bit of money into the facility to modernize it, but you don't want to give up that look and the art, you know, exactly. amazing art deco architecture mm -hmm. of, of Santa Anita 1934 building. Like you can't compromise that, but you have to modernize it so that the, you know, customer experience is, you know, great now. Wow. And, and the, you know, audio visual and, and presentation, we have probably 2000 TVs around the building and, and just modernizing some of this premium areas, especially, um, it's a, uh, it's a balance. You don't want You don't want to mess with the, a, a pretty historic building. So does your, when you're working these events or do you ever, does your horseman side ever come out? Do you ever want to feel, feel like you want to get back into it or <laughs> <laughs> sometimes, cool. you know, I, I love working with all the people, but sometimes you, you like working with the animals a bit more. So there's definitely times where, uh, I would rather go back and, uh, and saddle a horse and, and or even just walk them after a work than uh, some of the meetings we're in but it's uh, it's <laughs> I, I i'll you know the you walk outside anytime we have a a day that's a bit frustrating you just walk out and you look at the san gabriel mountains and you look at the view or you take a walk through the back stretch and you just you know pet a couple horses and talk to some of the some of the workers back there and uh it, it's a good reset on the on the business side well, and I think one of the um, things that is so great, too, that Santa Anita is like a, a model of for tracks around the country and like a lot of tracks that we work with. Um, and now with the news of like Split Rock coming um, your way, which for people don't know, the Split Rock show jumping tour is a really big um, nationally and internationally ranked show jumping competition mm -hmm. that is going to be it was announced a couple of months ago that it was going to be hosted um at santa anita park in the infield and as a hunter jumper, cool. i just think that is so fascinating i was you know i i love seeing those worlds collide um and i think it's it's so great that santa anita is it finds so much use um as an equestrian facility and property and family property and i think that's you know when we work with racetracks like for marketing um, purposes, that's what that's what we want them to be. They, you know, they want to be like hubs of family activity and um, horse activity, not just a place you go to gamble every now and then. Yeah, no, well, well said. We're we're very excited about the uh, the equestrian kind of build out coming in the infield and 
working with Splitwalk on the uh, World Cup qualifier. We, we've, it's been something we've talked about for a lot of years, just how it makes so much sense for Santa Anita to be more of a, a full equestrian center rather than just horse racing. That, you know, that I, I would guess in the years to come, there, you know, especially in Southern California, there's just not a lot of areas that you can come out and will look like our facility. It's one of the largest privately owned pieces of property in Southern California. So just utilizing it for more as much as possible and tying into the full uh, equestrian world on all sides, I think makes a ton of sense. So we're, you know, we start construction in that in March um, to get the infield ready. We'll have three large show rings in the infield with uh, hopefully level one footing and like it, it's going to be a top notch uh, operation. And I'm really excited to, to work with Derek and the Split Rock team and, and uh, uh, you know, get to try something new again, like as we've said before, like anytime you have to embrace these new things and I'm, I'm excited about it. It's not necessarily my world, um, much more on the racing side, but uh, uh, my wife and her her sister have been in that world for a long time. So I've, I've been to plenty of shows and now I'm, I'm going to jump full, uh, full steam ahead in on it. So. So Nate, you have off the track thoroughbreds of your own. Do you ride or compete at all? I, not in the show. Like we, uh, my wife's extended family's got a cattle ranch, and so we'll in the summers we usually get up there every summer, and uh, so I'll ride uh, when I'm up there. I don't ride at Santa Anita as much as I would probably like to. Um, they maybe should should get more into that, um, but it's uh, it's something I miss. But the, it's hard to find time to do uh, to do that as much yeah. as I'd like to. You've had a few things going on. <laughs> yeah, this place keeps me a bit busy, but. It, <laughs> Uh, when I can, I absolutely, but I've never shown her. Uh, actually, I met my wife in, at Colorado State. I had an off the track thoroughbred that I, he had retired and I, I, he was one of my favorites. So I took him to school with me because we weren't sure what, you know, and I said, I'll just ride him and, and like teach him to jump. Although I knew nothing about jumping. It was just like, you know, find something in front of me and just send him at it, see what happens. And, and he would jump it like happily. And, and then I, I met her and she was like, let me let me help. <laughs> Pity on me for uh, for not knowing what I was doing in that area, and, and and of course she taught him to jump, and he was he was good at it. But it was, uh, you know, it, that's definitely not my area of expertise, but I enjoy it. So I like that Caitlin touched on your horsemanship side, and you know, last night for Amplify, we actually had a young professionals networking event at the Keeneland Library. And that came up a lot, you know, the value of, of horsemanship and having hands-on experience with horses, regardless of what aspect of the industry you want to go into. Would you speak to how that's helped you in your role as a general manager? I, I think it's really important because it's, you know, the, we have at Santa Anita, for example, we have six to 700 people that live in our backstretch, you know, on a morning, busy morning training with close to 2000 horses. You know, we'll have at least 1500 workers out there, you know, and so you're you're even though they're not our employees, you're working with them on every level. And, the you know, the trainers are our stakeholders. We're partners in this. And and for us to succeed, you know, we need to work with them and they need to be successful and, and vice versa. So understanding, you know, what they go through to get up first thing in the morning, you know, at the track at three thirty or four and, and all the challenges they have. Um, you, you have to be able to speak their language a little bit and um, and understand their perspective. It's really important for, you know, as we're making decisions and, and things like that. And I think, you know, it, that's a very underrated thing with a lot of people that work in, in racing where they just don't really understand what, what their side of it and the, what they're dealing with on a day-to-day -day basis. So it's, it's really helpful for me, I think. And Santa Anita is so unique in that you guys have horses, I think, on the ground, 365. Is that right? Pretty close, like 10 months a year. We'll, we'll have a small window during the summer Del Mar meet where uh, we, we clear out, do any construction projects. We, we slam as much work as we can into the backstretch <laughs> and during a small window before they come back uh, as Del Mar wraps up. And then for the Del Mar fall meet, like that's running now, we'll have, you know, we're still 80% full, 70% right. full. Like they, I think they have just a few hundred horses down at Del Mar. So it's the operation has slowed slightly, you know, but not much. But it's a really unique challenge, basically having to have horses all the time and being able to keep up with the facility and manage, you know, 
the ongoing the upkeep and the day to day. Um, whereas some other tracks around the country might get a few months to breathe. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's, uh, it's, it's, you know, it's, it's a, a, a good thing and a bad thing to be basically year round operation and with the consolidation and Hollywood park going away and things. So we run almost, you know, close to eight months a year, live racing, and then train, like I said, 10 months a year. So it's, uh, it keeps you busy for sure. It's not, it's very different than some of the kind of seasonal or, you know, boutique meets where they run a, a short window and it's a, it's a whole different mentality and, and you have to handle things differently. Yeah. You guys are a true hub in Southern California. Nate, I really appreciated that your bio mentioned that you're an active volunteer for a lot of different animal related charities. I, I just think that's so cool to have somebody who's at the level of, um, you know, the a senior vice president of a track and general manager and you still volunteer. And so how do you find time to, to balance, you know, work life balance, being able to volunteer and give back time for your horses? How, how does Nate Newby compartmentalize <laughs> his life? <laughs> it, it, it's a challenge. Uh, you know, our, we have a, an off the track thoroughbred who uh, we had in New Mexico and we trained in New Mexico, Colorado, uh, you know, and now she's, she's a 97 full. So what is she? 26 and, and lives in a, uh, a pasture in, in Santa Barbara. So getting up to see her, like she's a, a happy camper up there at 26. And, and then we've, mostly my wife and I just help have retrained a ton of thoroughbreds over the years. I, that was, wow. we were doing that in college really as, you know, I don't know if it was a business, you know, we, you never, you don't make a lot of money on too many of them, but because yeah. we were very like particular, like we, we wanted to really bring them along probably further than most and make sure that they're, I, I really feel like the best thing you can do is make sure that they're good at everything and, and well-trained. And then that's going to ensure that they have a good life for the rest of their career. So we spent a lot of time on that and, and I still love that side of it. And, um, you know, again, that's one of the things you, you have to balance now. I don't, probably don't get to do as much of it as, as I used to, but I, uh, you know, I like to support in every way we can. And now I can, you know, understanding how that important, how important that is, I can really, uh, you know, help direct as many resources as we can to support those efforts. And, um, you know, it's a Strata group in Santa Anita where we spend a lot of money on it just fundraising and, and supporting karma and TAA and all those initiatives. It's, it's really important to us. And then any of the new things that we can do to, to help develop, uh, I'm, I'm all about them. Any general advice for a young person who's looking to get involved in the industry, something that, you know, you might've told your younger self, what would you tell another young person who wants to get involved? You know, I, I know it's it's a tough industry to jump into and I don't want to minimize that, but like if you can just get your foot in the door somewhere, somehow, like whether it's an in, a six week internship, whether it's volunteering, you know, uh, or or spending time on the backstretch and then walk in and just get to know people. Um, you know, if, if you can get your foot in the door and then as soon as there's an opening and I know some of that is, is timing and luck you know, jump right in, uh, work hard, say yes to anything, you know, the, it's not going to be a, a, an amazing like job day one. But if you if you work hard, I think, you know, I, I think you can get it where in, you're in a position years later where you're like, wow, this is amazing. So it's but it, it you, you just have to get your foot in the door somehow. And, and there's a lot of different ways to do that. And I know your your group spends a lot of time on that and, and anything we can do, do to support that. Um, you know, please let us know because I think it's so important. You know, we need we need more young people in the game. And and I'm 46, and I'm kind of in that middle where there's certainly a lot of racing executives older than I am. But you know, now, like we need we need that next generation below to to develop them and and so that they can work their way up and take my job in a few years. So um, you know, it's it's important. And but I think you just got it. You got to get your foot in the door and and then you know, show up, have a good attitude, work hard. And it, it sounds simple, but it's, I, I don't, I, at least from my experience, I don't have a better answer than that. <laughs> it's funny. So this last weekend, Amplify, this year we implemented this new travel award uh, initiative to our mentorship program where we selected four outstanding mentees and we ended up bringing three to Kentucky to do this weekend of behind the scenes tours. And they're all 
very much newcomers to the industry who've just been waiting for an opportunity to get more involved and have connections. And it was so refreshing to watch the, it was three young ladies, watch them over the weekend. They're so hungry for any opportunity to work, volunteer, be involved. And it's so cool how just, I remember, you know, younger Anise, I was excited to sweep barn aisles, you know, these jobs that were completely not glorious in any way seemed like the coolest thing ever, because I just wanted to have that connection. And, you know, I'm sure it's the same for all three of us when you're just so hungry to get involved with something and learn and be immersed in a certain, you know, industry even jobs that don't seem glorious are, are super cool at the time. So I, I think that's great. And we always yeah. like to promote volunteering and, and mentorship. And, you know, it doesn't matter if it's a high level, fancy position, just being involved can cannot hurt you in any way. Yeah, absolutely. Well said. Uh, yeah, yeah, I think even being a, a hot walker on the backstretch, you're going to learn something back there. You're going to, mm -hmm. A, you know, learn how the backstretch works. You're going to get to know people. You're going to, you know, understand that side. And, and then if you can jump around and, and get as many of those experiences as you can, uh, you know, in all facets of the industry, it's just going to help you later if you really want to work in this industry. So it's uh, well said and good advice. And I think it always comes back, you know, whoever we have on the podcast, it always starts with uh, the love and respect for the horse, right? Mm -hmm. Like they, um, you know, they got into it because they wanted to be around horses. <laughs> I don't know that we've ever had anybody who said, no, I just wanted to make money. <laughs> <laughs> no, there's, there's a lot of uh, industries where you're going to probably make more money and work less hours. <laughs> yeah. Most of us that have, have stuck around, it's because we love the horses and of course the people too, but, but you know, first off, First love is generally the horses. <laughs> well, Nate, thank you so much for for joining us today. Was were there any other things that you wanted to add or you know wanted us to touch on? No, I appreciate you having me on. And and like I said, anything that we can do, uh, you know, at Santa Anita and, and at First Racing to support the the work that you're doing, please reach out. And uh, anybody that that's watching or listening that wants to hit me up and ask questions or or come out and see us at Santa Anita, you have an open invitation. Thank you so much, Nate. I really uh, appreciate it. For all you guys, Santa Anita, you personally, Santa Anita first, everything you guys do for the industry. Thank you. Thanks. Well, thank you guys for joining us and especially thank you to our fantastic guest, Nate Newby. We know he has a lot on his plate. Um, it was so fascinating to learn more about Santa Anita. Again, one of the true hubs of horse racing and equestrian sport in the United States and in the world. And to hear how Nate has come up from being a horse trainer and an intern and working with off the track thoroughbreds to now his existing role managing nearly every single aspect of the track. So that's our show, guys. Thanks so much for joining. Anis, tell them where they can follow along. Until next time. You can follow Amplify Horse Racing on X, formerly known as Twitter, Facebook, Instagram. You can catch this episode in its video form on YouTube and listen to the podcast on any of your favorite podcasting platforms. We look forward to you joining us again on the next podcast.